If you were asked to retell the story of Noah from the Bible, what would you say? Let's think that through. Tell me. What would you tell me about the story from Noah? If somebody asked you, tell me the story of Noah, what would you say? He built an ark, right? What else? What is an ark? 40 days and 40 nights. The big boat. <laughs> the elementary kids are beating you guys. A giant boat. All right? Something about 40 days, 40 nights, rain. Okay, what else? What about them? Two by two. Okay. Yeah, one male, one female, right? Two by two. They all go on the ark. Um, what's the whole point of the story? Destroy. Okay. And so what was he doing? So he sent a flood. God was displeased. He sent a flood to do what? To, to cleanse the earth of what? Sin. Of all the people who had sinned. Right? He's going to wipe out. All the people who had sinned, and so and the animals, so uh, animals two by two. Uh, what else? And what about this flood? How big was it? That covered the whole earth, right? Even the tops of the mountains. So the ark, the boat, right, floats, covers even the tops of the earth. And uh, who is on the boat on the ark? No. And if you were listening to the second lesson, it told you. Eight people, so that's who? Noah, his, Noah, his wife, wife, his three sons, and, their three sons and, their and three wives. Right, there you go, very good. And um, let's see, what else? Uh, it covers most of it, right? Um, how'd they know it was time to go out of the ark? It's a dove. It's a dove. To find a branch. It's in a dove to find a branch, right? What happened before that? It stopped raining. It stopped raining? <laughs> Yes, it did stop raining, and yes, so you guys left some stuff out, but you got the gist of it, right? You can go home and read it in your Bibles, Genesis chapter 6 through 9. Take you, I don't know, take you 10 minutes to read the whole thing. But, right, animals two by two, but not all the animals were two by two. Some of the animals were seven. He brought seven of the clean animals. Um, the whole earth was covered. Uh, Noah is building the ark and is a warning to everyone, and no one listens. Right? No one listens. But then you left this part out. You got, got close to it, but not quite. God saw, this is chapter 6, the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth, that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out from the earth the human beings I have created. People together with animals and creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord. Or this part in chapter 8. So as soon as they, once the ark lands and they start going out, um, Noah makes uh, an altar. And those animals he took, the seven pairs of, he uses them to sacrifice. So Noah built an ark, an altar to the Lord. And took up every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on his altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing odor, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of humankind. For the inclination of the human heart is evil from youth, nor will I ever destroy every living creature as I've done before. And maybe that's not such the cuddly story that belongs in babies' nurseries after all, huh? Hmm. So we heard how God makes a covenant with Noah, right? We heard that story. That's chapter 9. But what is a covenant, right? A covenant is an agreement between two parties, a greater party and a lesser party. And each, each commits to duties of loyalty as specified in the agreement. So rather than simply being voided or nullified by failure of one party to complete the terms, in fact, it's the other side's allegiance that calls the errant party back into harmony. It's different from contract law. Now, the Old Testament's got several covenants, not just the famous one with the Ten Commandments there on Mount Sinai. That's Exodus chapter 20. And perhaps a covenant is implied with Adam and Eve, but that's for another time to talk about that. So there's a covenant made with Noah and his family following the flood. Uh, there's a covenant made with Abraham that he'll be blessed uh, by God to be a blessing. There's a covenant made with King David and his descendants who will reign on the throne forever. We mentioned the, the Exodus covenant already. 
And then there's a new covenant that's promised uh, by the prophets, especially Jeremiah. And then at the Last Supper, we hear Jesus say, this is the new covenant, right, the Last Supper. So the covenant following the flood that God makes with creation has two sets of expectations, right? one for humanity and one for God. And in these covenants, as we noted a second ago, one side's failure doesn't automatically nullify or void the other side's faithfulness. Neither does it trigger arbitration and renegotiation. God's side of the covenant is pretty clear. He will not destroy the earth again by a flood in verse 11. Now, humanity is given a list of duties. Depending on who reasons through it, at least four duties are given. No homicide, no fornication, no idolatry, and no consumption of life blood. Now, no doubt, even some folks in this room will reflexively tell us that morality can't be legislated. But here, at the very beginning of humanity's restart, these things are now binding on all of humanity. Right? This is not just for the Old Testament Hebrews and their descendants. There's nobody else other than Noah and his family. So everybody who comes after it's bound by this covenant. And to make the counter case that one uh, can't uh, legislate these things, right? Well, one will then find themselves arguing for homicide and incest at the very least. But those are proper human behavior. I don't think so. Now, clearly humans haven't done a very good job of keeping up our end of this bargain. Mm -hmm. Two things happen. First of all, we humans do not escape judgment. When Jesus comes again to judge the living and the dead, all will be held accountable to the terms of this covenant. But secondly, God has not revoked his side. No matter what the climate alarmists tell us, that Mother Earth will spontaneously flood and rid herself of the human parasites, God is still promising to not flood the whole earth again. But what is the problem that we humans face? We mentioned it earlier, the flood story tells us. We might think that since Noah was righteous, or Noah believed, right, that would be the proper way to understand that, or that Noah had faith in God, and that somehow, since we're all descended from Noah, then shouldn't we be on better footing than those who came before us? Eh, not so fast. So what happens after this story, right? So we heard, heard Noah's sacrifice, then we hear the promise, the covenant with the rainbow, and then what happens next as the story wraps up? Well, Noah goes and grows a vineyard and gets drunk on his new wine and exposes himself. And the son Ham comes across Noah and takes advantage of the situation in some kind of way. And then what we read in chapter 6 and 8 must still be true. The inclination of the human heart is evil, even from birth. In other words, it takes more than a catastrophic event to make a difference in everyday life. And I think we know this is true, right? If we're willing to look in the mirror, as they say, how many times has the prayer, Oh God, if you save me from this, I'll never do such and such again. I'll go to church every Sunday. I'll give 10% from now on. I'll say my prayers eight times a day. How often have such prayers left even our own lips? One place I used to live, these old boys got rescued from a pretty harrowing life or death situation. And they became local celebrities because they said how God had rescued them, etc., etc., etc. And they started making the rounds on the preaching circuit to give their testimony. All right. By the way, the, the way that works is that you get paid for it, which is not illegitimate. But, and then people start throwing themselves at you. All right. And so what do you know? Those same guys... Within a year or so, we're back to their old ways. I think one of them got, even, up getting, even ended up getting divorced. I don't lift those guys up as worse than the rest of us, by no means. I lifted their example because, uh, well, we'd all do the same if we were put in their situation. Why is that? Because well, the inclination of the human heart is evil from birth. What we need isn't a bigger, scarier force majeure to exploit and arm twist us into straightening up and flying right. That's not going to work. What we need to do is resist our bad hearts, not listen to them and follow them. We need new hearts, just like we'll sing a little bit from, in the offering song today from Psalm 51. Create in me a new heart, O Lord. So a covenant of mutual restraint 
did not solve the problem between sinful humanity and God. In many ways, it just sort of clarified the problem for us, which is good, right? A clear understanding of a problem is needed if we're going to solve it. So notice what Jesus says and what he doesn't say in the gospel lesson. He proclaims the good news, which is to repent and believe because the kingdom is here. Jesus does not tell us to follow or trust or believe in your heart. Now, no doubt someone objects and will come to me later at coffee time and say, well, pastor, that's not fair. That's not what I believe. I believe Jesus is in my heart. Well, if you've convinced yourself, then it must be true. How'd Jesus get in there in the first place? Well, I gave my heart to him just like the Bible says. He stood at the door and knocked. I think we got a picture there, right there. There's a picture of it, right? And so I gave my heart to him. Well, despite all the heart talk that the Bible has, it didn't actually talk about, quote, giving your heart to Jesus. That was made up in the last couple of centuries. And something about it always reminds me of that, uh, that famous scene from the movie Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. <laughs> and question number three, though, on your purple study and share insert. I'll take you a little deeper here with some of this heart language, all right? The Bible doesn't tell us to give our hearts to Jesus. And just remember that in Mark chapter 7, Jesus tells us all kinds of evil pours out of the human heart and makes us unclean. It's not our food or our unwashed hands or tableware. But giving your heart to Jesus is a fine thing to do. But it's not what we read in the Bible. And it's particularly not what we read today. Jesus tells us what to do, what we need to do. He tells us that his kingdom is here and that he brings it to us. That we must repent, that is, turn away from all the competing kingdoms, all the other systems out there in which we would place our trust. That we must believe the good news that in him, in Jesus, not in our hearts, we have forgiveness and new life and salvation. Well, this is much better than what exists in Noah's covenant. That humanity must not commit homicide, fornication, adultery, or consume lifeblood. Jesus is offering us a better deal. First of all, because we don't end up, hold up our end of the bargain. But second, the covenant doesn't promise us deliverance from our affliction. And yet, here with Jesus, in his kingdom... We receive what we could never provide for ourselves, the overcoming of evil. Right? You notice that, right? When Mark tells it, the story goes real quick, but in verse 13, Jesus defeats Satan in his temptations. To be in Jesus' kingdom is to have victory over evil and his inclinations. Now, you and I know that in baptism, right, which St. Peter tells us was modeled by the flood, it's what brings us into new life in his kingdom. Jesus tells us as well to repent and believe, as in keep doing it. Right, so being baptized into the kingdom is a beginning, not an end. I'd say that to be in the kingdom is to always repent and believe. And to stop doing so means that we find ourselves back outside the kingdom. And for our purposes, with these Bible stories today, what is it that we need to repent of and believe instead? Even after we've been baptized, our human hearts and their evil ways must still be resisted. Take, for instance, that first covenantal command against homicide. Between Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and the Lutheran small catechism or little handbook of Christianity, we learn that that inclination toward murder runs much deeper than the illegal crime of murder in the first. It includes a commitment to never harm our neighbor and to always help in every bodily need. Saying, I ain't never been to jail just isn't going to cut it in God's kingdom. We can say just as much for our human inclination toward fornication or, our, or idolatry as well with that covenant, just as our lust and our false trust run away with us quite easily. But what do we need to believe? If that's repent, what do we need to believe? That the old covenant with Noah tells us. The same thing that covenant with Noah tells us. God's guaranteed mercy. He's not here to destroy us, but to transform us. To give us new hearts, washed clean in the waters of baptism as those waters flood over them. 
to drown, not us as such, but that old evil creature we were before Jesus rescued us, just like God rescues Noah. To repent of your own depraved heart and believe what Jesus promises, what he guarantees for you, new life in his kingdom. Life that begins in baptism, that's renewed in confession, that's strengthened in communion, that's enlightened with the word, and that gives praise and thanksgiving in worship. Amen.